everyone to this afternoon session of the second day of Strings in Seoul. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Joseph Bena as our uh, first speaker of the afternoon from uh, Sacle, and he's going to tell us about the tadpole problem. Uh, so please go ahead, Joseph. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I think there's something with my mouth going on. I cannot escape, and for some reason, I'm having a hard time. Um, I'm having a hard time seeing my mouse. Uh, uh, just no, no. Oh, now I see it. Now I see it. Okay, let me go. Yeah, here. we can see it now. Okay, good. So, um, oh, but I, I think I cannot see it in full screen. We are oh. seeing it in full screen now. I see, but I, I cannot see it in full screen. <laughs> uh, okay. Is is it? Can you but, still do it, or you just? Yeah, yeah, no, no, sure, sure. I can. Uh, let me do this, and then uh, let me change it back. Maybe, maybe I changed it to the I changed it to the to the big size, and you know, there's there's a problem with the display or something. Yeah, maybe you can just make a bigger window as it is. Sorry. Maybe you can just make a big window. No, because I have, if I have a big window, I cannot show. I have animations. I have a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. Just one second. Just one second. It will be just one second. Uh -huh. It will be. Uh, it will be uh, accessibility. I'll make it. I'll make, I'll make it small again because the mouse is not so important. But I need to see where the mouse is at least to have an idea. Um, just a second. Uh, display, I think. Oh, the display. Okay. Yes. Well, cursor size. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if it's better now. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so thanks, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for um, for the invitation to speak. Uh, this is work which has been going on in Sakle for the past uh, uh, many many years uh, with the guys uh, with the guys on the, on this um, on this list. The guys in blue and red are applying for uh, postdocs, so you know please remember them if you see the name in the applications. Uh, these guys are applying this fall, I think, uh, and those are the guys who give me money. Uh, now we know there's a big problem in uh, in. Um, in, in, in real life physics, so there's a huge fine tuning which you observe. There's a cosmological constant, there's an actual weak scale, there's an inflation. And one way to explain the fine tuning, which people referred for many years, has been to say that you know there's some symmetry or something, and you know, uh, by by some by some nice uh, by some nice uh, miracle supersymmetry don't explain everything. However, um, there's another explanation which involves the fact that um, uh, you know if one can find more than 10 to the 120 universes, which is you know the, the tuning of the cosmological constant, um, we can just find all these huge amount of universes, and then you know we can explain everything anthropically. And in string theory, you know people argue that you know you can find 10 to the 500 possible compactifications to 4D. Uh, in a theory, uh, one can build even more. Uh, there's like this uh, famous Calabria 4 which has a super mega big. Uh, um, Euler number, and you know, essentially, the, you can you can build 10 to the 270,000 vacua. So you know, we're talking about a huge amount of vacua, and basically, this anthropic uh, this anthropic way of thinking, you know, in, according to this, you know, the fundamental laws of physics don't come from you know some deeper underlying theory. You have many many universes; each of them has its own physical laws, and it just happen to be in one of them, and you know, and that's the end of the story. So this has been again this this um, this uh, number of vacua, and you know, this. Um, um, this way of thinking has been, you know, motivating and driving um, string cosmology for um, for a while. Now, the standard law in string cosmology, again, the way to get this many vacua is to compactify uh, string theory to fit to four dimensions, and you do it on a Calabria manifold or, or some six D manifold, which usually has a huge amount of massless scalars. Now, this is the kind of Calabria. Uh, this is the kind of Calabria uh, uh, picture. What you do afterwards, you put fluxes and get you know, condensation, and you fix up the moduli. So you, you, you do this, you, you put up fluxes on these various cycles on the Calabio. Now you have the A cycles in red and the B cycles in green, for example. And then you basically get a huge amount of, you, you, have, you get a huge amount of anti de vacua. And then you put anti d 3 brains, and you need, you need to put this anti d 3 brains down some regions with a, with a huge, uh, with a huge war factor, because um, otherwise, you know, they bring up too much energy, and you know, this is going to be problematic. So you put this anti d 3 brains, and then uh, these anti d 3 brains are going to be are going to lift up the energy, and you're going to lift up anti the the sitter. So this is in a sense the schematic story of how to get on how to get um, uh, how, how to get a string theory how to get a string theory. Um, um, Compactification to the sitter, and basically um, this is just you know the way to get the landscape. Now there are three stages in this construction. Uh, the first stage is to fix up um, the complex structure moduli, which are like the shapes of the Calabiao. 
Um, and this is done by putting fluxes on topologically, uh, topologically non-trivial uh, non three cycles. And you know, this fixes up, this fixes up the, um, this fixes up the, uh, this fixes up the, uh, cosmo the, um, the, this complex structure moduli. Then we fix the, the, the Kelo moduli by using either the three instantons or the seven brains to get genome condensation. Uh, this is the second stage. And the third stage is to add, add antibrains to uplift the anti the cosmological constant to the sitter. Now, all this is nice and beautiful. Um, the problem is that in the KKLT construction and in, in most of the string phenomenology constructions, what one does, people use low energy effective field theory uh, using string field derived ingredients. So these steps are basically done um, using a 4D superpotential and 4D kilo potential and you know, using some 4D low energy effective field theory with string theory derived ingredients. But the problem is when you put these ingredients back in string theory, what you find is that there are non-trivial interactions between these ingredients. And in particular, uh, the ingredients which appear at step one, meaning the fluxes, they can mess up the antibrains at step three. The ingredients which appear at step three, the antibrains, they can mess up the modular stabilization by fluxes at step one. The ingredients which appear at step one, uh, the fluxes, they can actually be inconsistent. Um, and moreover, the ingredients which appear at step three, the antibrains can actually mess up um, the, the Kähler modular stabilization. Those are the three, uh, those are like, you know, essentially four areas where the, 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 the ingredients can interact on trivially. And, you know, we, we have studied, we have worked on, on, on most of them. The, during this talk, I'll present the first three things. So again, the effect of fluxes on antibrains, antibrains on fluxes and the fluxes with themselves. And most of it is going to be about this part where the, I'll be discussing the that problem. This is work in progress and, you know, um, I'll be reporting about it later. And we call this uh, non-trivial facts escape Zilla because you know it's something which you know reduces this huge mega big landscape of string vacua. Uh, it's just you know it's, it's just uh, eat, eat, eating them up. And uh, basically, these non-trivial interactions show that you know the the landscape is much much smaller than uh, than uh, what, what what people naively believe. And this is a picture of escape Zilla. If you want to have um, if you want to have a picture of, of how of how escape Zilla looks, this is the this is the picture of uh, of escape Zilla eating up something which looks like a bunch of universes. Now, the first result, um, the fact that fluxes can mess up antibrains, uh, it's easier to see, again, in this long throat region of the compactification. So you have a compactification, there's a long throat. The long throat is best um, approximated, you know, the, the, there's a geometry which is the prototypical description of a long throat, which is the klebanov strassler geometry. The klebanov strassler geometry basically looks, uh, is a deformed conifold. The conifold has basically topological, uh, a topological three sphere, which is, which is finite at the bottom and has a two sphere. And moreover, the klebanov strassler throat has non-trivial fluxes, F3 and H3, which give you a D3 charge dissolved in the fluxes. So this is the, this is the, this is the klebanov strassler uh, warp default, uh, warp deformed conifold um, geometry. Now, what one does in klebanov strassler again, in order to mimic adding antibrains to the bottom of this throat, you put some antibrains at the bottom of klebanov strassler and this breaks supersymmetry. This antibrains break supersymmetry. And moreover, uh, besides breaking supersymmetry, they, um, uh, they can also annihilate. So there's a process by which these antibrains can decay and they can annihilate against the, the, the positive DT charge in fluxes, leaving, um, giving a supersymmetric solution. So it looks like in klebanov strassler if you put antibrains, you get a metastable, a metastable configuration, which then decays. And this was actually shown, this was actually argued by Kartu Pearson in Berlin, and also by Maldasena and Nastase in a similar paper, that essentially antibrain probes, when you put them in these backgrounds, they basically give you, an, uh, give you a, metastable, a metastable configuration. Now, this is the story in the probe approximation. However, if you go beyond the probe approximation, which is what we did, what you find is that the story is a bit more complicated. Um, what's happening is that the Klebanov Strasser solution has some fields which go logarithmically with the radius. Um, this is because uh, the dual gauge theory has a coupling constant. The coupling constant in four dimensions go logarithmically with the energy. And this gauge theory has two, has two, um, has two uh, coupling constants. And their difference grows like the integral of B of the B field on the, on the two cycle of Clevon Strasser, which, which goes like log R. And again, this reflects the fact that all four D gauge theories, which are which are not conformal, have a low running coupling constant. This is a universal feature of this is a universal feature of four D of four dimensional gauge theories that you know that, 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 that the coupling constant runs logarithmically with the energy. Now, when you add on the D three brains, what's happening? And you know, you look at you look at their back reaction. 
uh, you go beyond the probe approximation, which was used by Kartu, Pearson, and Belinda, uh, what you find is that the center brain is coupled to this field. They talk to this field. Uh, it's not hard to see that you know there's an F5 of the anti brains and the B2 and the H and the F3 of the background, and they all talk to each other. And when you have a log field, the intuition which you obtained again, which we did in, 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 in some brain construction a while ago with uh, Nati Seiberg and uh, collaborators, was that the metastability of a probe when you have a log field is an artifact of the probe approximation. And if you look at the full calculation, you, you'll actually find that the full calculation is actually not is actually not metastable. And what we did, we actually looked at the, back, uh, at the back reaction of the center brains, and we found two possibilities. Um, one possibility, and you know, it's, it's a very complicated solution. It depends on like, you know, 10 fields and so on and so forth. Um, one possibility is that the anti brain, you can actually arrange that the, the infrared of the solution is very happy, but the log is affected, then this messes up the, the infinite, the, the, the UV, and then the anti brains are not, are not met, uh, metastable. So you can find a solution with a happy infrared with no singularity in the infrared, but with the, with the screwed up ultraviolet, which is, again, doesn't correspond to a metastable vacuum. Or you can find another solution where the um, UV is happy, the UV is unaffected, but there's an infrared singularity, which gives rise to a tachyon. And that's basically uh, what you want to do, again, in Klebanov's structure. If you, want to, if you want to glue Klebanov's structure to some flux from multiplication, then you want to put an brain. You want to keep the UV unaffected, because otherwise you cannot glue. And then you find that the antibrains have a tachyon. We also did this at the level of the full supergravity back reaction. We constructed this anti D3 brain solution uh, with smeared anti D3 brains. Um, the fluxes of Klebanov Strassler forces this anti D3 brains to polarize either into a D5 brain wrapping some, some S2 inside T11 or into some NS5 brain wrapping some uh, S2 inside the three sphere. This is the, this is the polarization which was also observed in the probe approximation. However, if you look at the polarization potential, it looks, you know, has some form which is, you know, fourth order term, cubic term, and quadratic term. And what we found was that this term, A2, is exactly zero. Again, very complicated system, uh, 10 equations, like, you know, 20 constants, and, you know, a bunch of free parameters, and everything came down. And, you know, this A2 parameter could have been positive or negative or zero. It came out to be exactly zero. And then you can also show that other directions in the background are negative. And therefore, anti D3 brains, a bunch of them are tachyonic. Now, this is the calculation done in the regime of anti brains back react. You can also do the, the calculation when the, when the antibrains don't back react in the regime of parameters when just in terms of the number of antibrains is much, much smaller than one. Um, and then you put antibrains in fluxes. The theory of the antibrains is n equals four super angles, but the fluxes give masses to the squarks and to the geginos. And <laughs> basically, you can find that there's a, there's a quadratic level potential. The potential of the, of the, of, of the deformed theory looks like a supersymmetric. Um, Looks like a, uh, like an n equals four theory broken down to n equals one star. This is the, the the red terms are basically n equals one star, but then there's another term which is the blue term, which is basically uh, breaking the, the supersymmetry down to n equals zero star, and you find that anti anti d brains are supersymmetry breaking, which you know you kind of expect. Um, however, the supersymmetry breaking is very funny because you have this three level superpotential. This is the the, the three level superpotential. And you can see that if you combine these terms, the supersymmetric term and the non-supersymmetric term, there's a flat three-level potential. Because again, these terms are, are equal and opposite. So basically, there's no potential for the antibrains to move on the S3. There's a flat three-level three potential for moving on the S3. And <clears throat> what you can show by doing, uh, but this was shown by Park and West in 84, and you, know, you can show by doing Feynman diagrams and you know, by looking at various theorems, that this potential remains flat to all orders in perturbation theory. So basically, what you can show is that anti brains have this flat direction, which again implies that, and you can find this flat direction all the way from G string n much, much smaller than one, uh, three level, one loop, two loops, three loops, you know, all loops. And then you can also find it non perturbatively at G string times n much, much bigger than one using the full back rate string theory. So this implies that this flat direction is always there. And therefore, you can show that this brain brain repelling tachyon is always there. So this is the argument uh, we had. You know, this was back in 2015. That even from an anti brain perspective, even when just in terms n is much, much smaller than one, anti brains are always going to be tachyonic. So two anti brains or more, they have a problem. You put them in Klebanov Strasser, you put them in any background you want, they have a problem. But one anti brain may still be happy. So then what we did was we said, okay, maybe one anti brain is happy, maybe one anti brain doesn't have this stupid tachyon. Uh, <clears throat> Let's try to see what the antebrain does when you put it in Klebanov-Strassler. Let's see. Let, let's try to see whether the, the antebrain itself affects Klebanov-Strassler. 
Now, the Kleberos has a solution, as I told you, it has a non trivial three sphere and the two sphere. The two sphere shrinks at the tip, but the three sphere remains finite. However, there's another geometry, which is the Klebanov cyclin solution called KT. And in the Klebanov cyclin solution, um, the, the, both the three sphere and the two, and the two sphere shrink, shrink at the origin. And the way to go from one to the other one is to deform the conifold. There's a conifold deformation modulus. If I just look at the manifold as a six dimensional space, uh, there's, a, there's a conifold deformation modulus. And you know, essentially, the, uh, the, the, conifold, um, the conifold size is, uh, is, is just a flat direction. Uh, when you put everything in a flux compatification, of course, things are going to be more uh, more non-trivial. You know, when you put everything in a flux compatification, you'll have um, you know you may have you, uh, this will be this will be stabilized. This this modulus will be stabilized. But in an infinite Klebanov solution, this is a flat direction. Now, when you have a flat direction, and you put some energy, you never stay there because you know when you have a flat direction, you put some energy, you always go you know to in some direction or, or some other. You know, any flat potential, any flat potential ends up being ends up being destabilized. And what we expected was that you put one integrating in Klebanov Strassler. This has some energy. And when you have a flat direction, this will give you a runaway behavior to Klebanov cycling. And basically, we can do the calculation. And that's what we did with, uh, with uh, uh, the Severin Lust and uh, Mariana Gagna. Uh, we did the calculation. Uh, you can compute the potential for the, for the motion of the jaw, again, for the S modulus, which is the deformation modulus of, of, of the, of the Klebanov Strassler geometry. And it's given by this uh, by this formula, which was found by Douglas and Toroba a long time ago. Um, this is the the, the 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 orange result is the is the naive result. But then there's a quantum correction, which is again this blue term, which modifies the potential and, and makes it like this. Um, when you add an anti-brain, a single anti-brain, you bring in a, another term, another energy, which is proportional to the s modulus to this power times you know, these various various factors of this string and m and the volume and so on and so forth. Um, and what we found was that essentially, if the number of for a single anti brain, if the flux of the Klebanov Strassler three cycle is uh, very small, the anti brain just runs uh, the, the, the S modulus, the, the, the tip of the geometry just goes to the origin. So, you know, essentially the Klebanov Strassler solution is collapsing into Klebanov cycling. However, if the if the anti brain is uh, if the anti brain um, is, is, is attached to geometry which has a large, which has a large uh, M. A large square root of this thing times m, like you know, seven or higher, uh, including you know this, um, you know, and then you can see that the anti brain can actually give a, give a metastable configuration. So that's interesting. It looks like one anti brain can do the job uh, if the throat is very very small, it will destabilize it. But if it's basically lo uh, long enough and big enough, it will not destabilize it. So then you know, looks like one anti brain is happy. Uh, as a side comment, uh, there are some people who like uh, ADSQCD and you know, who like uh, doing uh, holographic duals of, of gauge theories. Um, the fact that an anti brain does not stabilize an infinite Klebanov structure for large M um, is an interesting fact. And you know, we noticed it by doing this calculation. Uh, but then we say, look, anti brain is destabilizing because it brings some energy. But you can also bring some energy by putting a small black hole, by putting a small black hole horizon. You can also bring some energy. So therefore, a small black hole horizon in Klebanov Strassler should not destabilize the tip either. And you know, we predicted this black hole. We conjectured the black hole in our paper uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Severin and Mariana and Emilian Dubash. Now, uh, however, um, and this black hole basically we predicted it. And then you know, uh, Alex Bushel was working on numerics, and he was actually able to find this black hole to construct the black hole numerically. Um, and basically, uh, this black hole exists, you know, confirming our our theoretical prediction. So you know, we got experimental confirmation that you know what we are doing is is correct. Uh, this black hole is due to a phase, a phase of the gauge theory which is deconfined but with broken chiral symmetry. So you know, those of you who like ADSQCD, I invite them to look at this black hole. I think it's an interesting piece of physics. And what we found is that again, the black hole exists, but not for all the possible um, uh, energies, and not for, uh, not, uh, not for all the possible not for all the possible um, uh, ranges of uh, ranges of um, uh, energy. And ba basically, for the anti brain, the anti brain uh, gives a metastable configuration when square root of this thing times m is bigger than square root of the number of the three brain times this factor called gamma, and gamma for the anti brain is six point eight. Uh, for end, for the black hole, we translated the black hole units and you know then the black hole energy into anti brain units, and what we found is that this number for, is 4.16. Now, it's important to note the anti brain is a single one. The back reaction is small. For the black hole, there's a full back reaction. So these calculations are actually done in two different regimes of parameters, and they give you you know comparable physics. So I think the intuition is very clear. You put a tiny amount of energy in Klebanov Strassler, it stays there. You put a lot of energy, 
plop, it goes away and it becomes clevonocyclin. So that's basically the that's basically the ingredient we found. And basically, again, this runaway mode. We found this runaway mode when uh, basically, unless M is much much bigger than this than this construction, um, unless M is much much bigger than this, uh, there's a runaway mode which corresponds to the jaw becoming longer and longer. However, the jaw already has to be long because in Kleban or Strassler, and you know, when you do a flux form vitrification and you put antibrains, you need to have a large UVIR hierarchy. And that's because uh, there's a wall factor at the bottom given by this hierarchy. And this wall factor needs to be small because otherwise anti debrain uplift is going to completely scrub uh, the, the, the tuning of the cosmological constant and so on and so forth. And what you can show is that, I mean, the, the, the hierarchy is known, it's, it's given by 2 pi k over 3 g string times m. You multiply by an M and an M here, and you find that the, the, the denominator, you find this ugly term, which is again the square of this guy of ours. The number of the three brains of an anti three brains has to be one. You cannot have like you know one fifteenth of an anti three brain, and therefore this configuration and KM is the flux in the throat of the Klebanov Strasser geometry. So this hierarchy basically becomes the flux in the throat divided by the six point eight squared, and this has to be bigger than uh, one percent. That's basically this is the list. Uh, this is the list of the hierarchy you, you, you can construct. And KKLT is actually even higher. Um, is actually even smaller. And you can show that because of that, the hierarchy requires that the, the, the throat of the Klebanov Strassler, again, this region of the Klebanov Strassler throat, must have a charge, must have a charge, which is bigger than about 100, maybe 500, maybe 200, but you know, it's bigger than 100. That's the requirement. So essentially, what you are showing is that antibrains exist in KKLT, you know, antibrains can be used only, only if this long throat of the Klebanov Strassler geometry has a charge which is of order 100. Now, uh, this is nice and beautiful, but you know that when you have a flux from multiplication, the charge has to be equal to zero uh, because it's a compact space. So then you need to find 100 units of charge. And <clears throat> as my friend Master Yoda would say, plus 500 units, 100 un units of charge Master Kalabiao has. How embarrassing, how embarrassing. How can we find these units of charge? Now, you can say, how can we get minus 100 units of charge? Well, you can put oriented for three planes, but you know, you cannot put too many of them. So, you know, the most you can get is minus 32. But you have other ingredients. You have you can actually put the seven the, the seven planes, the seven brains on a four cycle S with a huge Euler number. Or in F theory, you can take a Calabia of four in F theory, and there's a negative charge which is given by the Euler characteristic divided by 24. Um, so you have the number of D3 brains in the throat, which is again a hundred. And then you have also the other fluxes of the Calabia, which again are given by this contribution. This is again written, written in F theory language. And the negative contribution is given by the Euler number of the Calabia of four. So then, you know, maybe you can do this. Maybe you can, you can, you can, um, you can uh, accommodate 100 units of, of charge in this Clever on the throat in a flux from bitification. Um, and indeed, you know, there's like this mega big um, Calabia of four, which has again this Euler characteristic. So the number of three brains, the total contribution here is 75,000. So you'd say, ah, no, no problem. I just put this Calabia of four. I put this Calabia of four. I look at this compactification. I add the clever stars and throat. No problem. I'll get, I'll get my, I'll get my nice, uh, I'll get my nice beautiful uh, um, compactification. However, we cannot go so fast because the only characteristic of the four cycle is given by a combination of the um, of the Hodge numbers, and in particular. Um, it, it grows mainly because of H31. So essentially, this, this other characteristic um, has a huge number of moduli, of complex structure moduli, which are basically I'm calling here H31. So these moduli are flat. And when you do a flux from quantification, you need to stabilize them. You know, you need, you need to stabilize all the, all, 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 all the complex structure moduli. And in here, you have 300,000 moduli, which need to be stabilized. How can they be stabilized? You need to put flux. But when you put flux, the flux is going to come here, and the flux is going to give you extra tadpole. So the question is, can you play the game or not? Can you put a huge Calabiao with a huge Euler number and a huge number of 3,1 moduli, and can you put flux on them such that you still have a negative result? And what I'll be arguing is that the, number, the, the amount of the 3-charge, which, uh, which these fluxes can source, is going to be bigger than 100,000. Um, and therefore, you, even by putting these mega bicalabiaos, you'll never ever be able to absorb these 100 units of D3 charge in the throat. That's going to be my argument. But this is basically where we were um, a few years ago. But then the question is, how much charge? How much charge do this modular source? 
again, do, do this fluxy source. I have, you know, 300,000 moduli. I need to put fluxes to stabilize them. How much charge do how much charge uh, do, do, do these charges? Uh, how much how much charge do, um, do these fluxes have? And basically, this is what we call the Tatpole question. We can ask ourselves in a general compactification with a large number of complex structure moduli, uh, which are fixed by fluxes. How, what, how much is the Tatpole sourced by these fluxes? Now, what has been believed for a long time, uh, and you know, this is what said, what enters in the 10 to the 500 calculation, is that you have a Calabiao. You throw some fluxes on the cycles, and again, this is a, the, those are the flux numbers. This is the intersection number. This is the D3 uh, tadpole, and basically, you just throw the fluxes on the cycles, and everything is, go, is going to be hunky dory. The fluxes are going to stabilize on the moduli, and you can have any tadpole you want. If you get this matrix to have uh, to, to give you a total product of one or two or three or ten or zero, you know, there's no problem. So, for example, you know, you can have you can have an example like this, where this is the intersection matrix, which is just you know some A B A B. Um, you know, it's just a chunk of the intersection matrix of the, of the Calabiao. You put flux on the, only on the A cycles, for example, the charge is zero. And therefore, you know, you don't have to pay any penalty for putting these charges. You don't, you don't, you don't have to pay any tadpole. These charges, these fluxes, which, which again, if I have this kind of fluxes, they give me zero tadpole. So people believe that, you know, such configurations are possible. This is basically what has been, what is believed. And, you know, this is again behind the calculation of 10 to the 500. However, what has been constructed is a bit more complicated. So actually, we know we have constructed bubbling solutions. We have bubbling solutions which have cycles, topological non-trivial cycles, with fluxes, which are basically stabilizing n flux n, uh, n cycles. Uh, these bubbling solutions were constructed by Nick Warner and I and you know Chiwei Wang um, a while ago. Um, basically, we wanted to reproduce to, to find microstate geometries or fastballs of the M2 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 black hole. And these bubbling geometries have non-trivial cycles with non-trivial fluxes. And you can ask a similar question, given n bubbles, how much charge do you have? How many, how, how many charges do you have given n bubbles? And the answer which we found was that, and again, here we have the explicit geometry. We're not talking about some Calabiao whose geometry we don't know and they just put things. We have the explicit ds squared equals, you know, blah, plus, blah, plus, blah. We have the explicit geometry. And here you can ask ourselves, you know, um, what's the charge you get? Of course, you don't want any, any garbage, any closed time curves or anything. And what we found is that the charge goes like the number of, flux of cycles squared. Now, you can ask, why can't you get a bubbling geometry with a charge of order n or with a charge of order 1? The reason is that there's a word factor satisfying some equation like this. This is the same equation as in flux from Um, And if you have a um, charge of order 1, GOHG, which gives you the charge in the fluxes, must be both positive and negative. When G over G is negative, the war factor becomes very unhappy and wants to be negative. And this is going to give you closed timeline curves. And in fact, most of the fluxes you put, so if you just give, if I just give you a, a multi-center given something geometry, and I ask you, you know, please go ahead and put some fluxes there, you will get closed timeline curves. Most of the fluxes you put are going to give you clo closed timeline curves. Very few of them are going to be regular. And all the few of them which are regular and have no closed timeline curves have Q of order N squared. Impossible for us, at least it has been, and you know, we know this geometry is quite well, uh, to get a smaller charge from fluxes on n cycles. So it looks like we have two different numbers. People believe that you know Q can be over the one uh, for uh, you know in Calabiao physics, people who do flux compatifications, people who do black hole physics believe that Q is over the n squared and not less. However, you can show very easily that the Q cannot be over the one because if, if you can get the Q to be over the one. We using an arbitrary number of, of bubbles at fixed charge. All these bubble geometries, they basically have, have to be counted and they enter in the in, in the calculation of the black hole entropy. So if if, if, if with Q over the you know, one, you could blow up an infinite number of bubbles, then so if Q remained one in the large in the large number of bubbles limit, then you could actually get an infinite entropy out of these bubbles, and you can actually overcome the black hole entropy and disprove the CFT. So you know there's a good physical reason why Q cannot be over the one. It has to be bigger than one. Now, you can ask this type of question in, in flux compatibility in three incarnations. Incarnation number one, you can do in type 2D, and you can say in type 2D, I have H21 complex structure moduli stabilized by three form fluxes. There's a question of how much Q is in the fluxes. You have F3, you have H3, and then basically there's a Q in the flux. And basically, there's a question how does Q in the fluxes grow with H21? You can ask the type of question in the second incarnation using the seven moduli. When you have the seven brains, 
Uh, they are stabilized by, by some mode volume F2, which only exists as some special place in moduli spaces. When you put an F2 there, the brain is stuck. And you can also ask how much Q flux is sourced by F2. You can also ask the Tatler question in the third incarnation, which is again the sum of the two. If you, if you do F theory on a Columbia of four, the complex structure moduli and the D7 moduli combine in um, F theory complex structure moduli. The three form fluxes and the F2 on the D7 brain combine in a four form flux uh, G4. And the fluxes, basically, the, the, the tadpole, uh, the, the Q in the flux is given by G4 versus G4. Um, and this, again, has to be smaller than the uh, Euler characteristic divided by 24, because otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, then again, this contribution includes the sevens or sevens and, 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 and everybody else. And this, this Euler characteristic is given by this, by this uh, sum of the, sum of the um, Betty numbers. And if you want to stabilize this moduli by fluxes, in the, in the, you want to stabilize this, but these are, these are the modules stabilized by fluxes. And in the large H31 limit, this goes like one quarter of the number of moduli. So it looks like uh, when you have, if you have, a, if you have a tadpole question, the question is, how does Q go with the number of moduli? And moreover, does Q, is Q going to be less than one quarter of the number of moduli or bigger than one quarter of the number of moduli or of the same order or like, you know, much, much smaller, much, much bigger, over the one, over the n squared. This is, in a sense, the physical limit. This is the bound. If Q is above the bound, then you cannot satisfy the tadpole. If Q is below the bound, then you know everything is hunky dory. If Q is over the one, you know you can overcome the black hole entropy. You know you can. It's even more hunky dory. Now we have the answers. We have a whole bunch of examples which were computed, and you know some of them were computed ourselves. Uh, including again type to be in some modular space plan points, F theory on, on, on a sexy Calabiao, um, F theory on a CP3 base. Um, we are doing a paper with Callum Brody and uh, Mariana Grania where we're computing F theory on any weak funnel base. And basically, again, you, you, are, you are basically looking at, at a huge amount of spaces where you compute, again, you put some D7 brains and you look at the, at the D7 stabilization. And what we are finding is that the minimum charge needing to stabilize the moduli is actually proportional to the number of moduli. And the proportionality constant, basically alpha, which is again, Q minimum divided by the number of moduli, is around 0 0.4, 0 0.35, 4, 3, 5, you know, it's basically in this, in, 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 in this range. Here is 0 0.3, but it's a very symmetric, it's a very symmetric um, space. Uh, we also did, we also looked at uh, M theory on K3 times K3 uh, with Severin Lust and Johan Blovak and uh, Mariana. And there we did some genetic algorithms and you know we did some horrible horrible searches and so on and so forth. And we were basically able to find 25 um, uh, vacuo with, with, with the tadpole with a Q in, in the flux is equal to 25, but we couldn't find anything with the, with the Q equals 24. We found like you know a few hundred thousand vacuo like this, but nothing with 24. So you know we believe it's a strong, it's a strong bound. So all these examples are basically pointing towards um, this number being uh, around you know bigger than one third at least. So then as a result, we came with the tadpole conjectures. First of all, the first tadpole conjecture is that the smallest charge sourced by the fluxes, the stabilized and moduli grows linearly with n. And the second conjecture is that the proportionality constant alpha is actually bigger than one third. We put one third because again, it looks like a reasonable uh, number given, given all the previous data. Um, what's interesting is, uh, what I want to remark is that this Q mean is not the generic value, so it's not the typical value. The generic value when you have fluxes is going to go like n squared, the number of moduli squared. This is the generic flux. If you just put generic fluxes to stabilize the moduli, this is going to go like n squared. Um, this Q mean is the minimal value. And also there's a caveat, all these calculations which we, which we showed, there's no corresponding supergravity solution. Nobody checked that the solution doesn't have any closed standard curves or anything. This is just, you know, based on effective field theory and Calabi-Aus and, you know, putting some fluxes and, you know, look, make it, making sure that everything makes sense. So, with the, I mean, things can actually be even worse. You know, maybe, maybe, things, maybe, maybe things grow more than linearly, but we don't know. The implication of that pro conjecture is, again, as I showed you, the Q in the fluxes has to be smaller than the, than the Euler, Euler characteristic, which goes like one part of the number of moduli for a large number of moduli. But the tadpole conjecture is saying that this Q in the fluxes is bigger than one third of the number of moduli. And there's a problem here, you know, one third is bigger than a quarter. And therefore, basically what this is showing, if the tadpole conjecture is correct, uh, we're basically arguing that there are no F-theory vacua with a large number of stabilized H31 moduli. 
Um, essentially, again, all these super mega big uh, FT recompactifications, you know, all the 10 to the power 270,000 vacua, which you can find out putting FT flux, fluxes on, on, this, on this super, super mega big Calabiao, for example, all of them are going to have flat directions. All of them. It will be impossible to stabilize. It will be impossible to stabilize all the modular using fluxes. Because again, if you stabilize the modular, you have to put so much tadpole and you only have this much tadpole. So, you know, you can never make it work. Um, and in general, the seven brains wrapped in a four cycle with a large order characteristic, they will give you a negative tadpole contribution, no problem, which will be like, you know, over the chi over 24, but they'll have moduli. And stabilizing the moduli by fluxes is going to cost you some tadpole, and the tadpole will be over there, chi over 18. So adding the seven brains on, this, um, on these things, even if naively it looks like you get a huge tadpole, if you want to stabilize the moduli, what you can find is that they actually increase the tadpole. So basically that's, that's, the, that's the result. So back to the sitter, back to our previous calculation, um, you can apply to the anti brain if the throat of the charge is bigger than 100. That's what, that's what uh, we are good. Um, but it's very hard to absorb this 100 units of tadpole with stabilized moduli. Basically, we cannot do it with those threes and those sevens or the sevens. We, we just cannot do it. It's, it's not it's not doable within our within with the present technology. Maybe there's some other ingredient, mysterious ingredient in type to be non-geometric. I don't know. Maybe there's something, but with the with the known ingredients, O threes, O sevens, and the sevens, we cannot do it. It cannot be done. And with the, the sevens, I told you that if you put the sevens, it's a losing game. You put the sevens, you think, hey, I st I'm stabilizing moduli. I'm very smart, but once you put them, you can actually find that you can actually find that uh, that uh, with, um, you are playing a losing game. The more the sevens you put, the more complicated you make the cycle they wrap. The more the more uh, the, the more the, the more modular you have, and the more tadpole you source. So the sevens, I think the sevens is, is a losing game. Now, how can we go around? How can we get some desitter? Um, first of all, in KKLT, it's very important to get a hierarchy. If you don't have a hierarchy, it's very hard to get a small positive lambda. Um, people have been able to get the sitter with no hierarchy. There's a nice paper by uh, uh, Susha Banan and uh, Ivana Zavala and collaborators who are basically finding a sitter with no hierarchy. Um, it's at a huge cosmological constant. So, you know, it's basically, it needs improvement, but you know, it's a step. You can just do the sitter, you don't, you don't get a long throat. You put the anti brain somewhere and you know, there is going to be very happy. And basically you get a sitter with no hierarchy. Maybe for LVS, for large volume scenarios, you need, you need to have a smaller hierarchy. There's a paper by, uh, about that. So maybe, you know, LVS is going to be better than KKLT. I don't know. But the jury is out there. People are trying. People are actively trying to get to go around, to go around this, um, to go around this problem. And there are also caveats to this problem. There's a caveat, there's a question, okay, great. We have this nice, we have this nice, we have this nice uh, um, calculation, but okay, a, a conjecture is, you know, it's only good until you find a counterexample. So the so the question is, you know, why, you know. How do we know based on all these examples that uh, you know the conjecture is correct? Um, in a sense, we only found the conjecture using the some space with, with, with special properties. You know, we basically looked at you know k3 times k3, we looked at you know cp3, we looked at like you know nice symmetric vibrations. So maybe when you have less symmetric spaces, things are going to be different. That's what you know you can hope. However, for a theory, Calabiao's fibered over a basis or, or over a b3. Oh, we tried, we did for, I mean, it was done by Denef and Sole and Colinucci for CP3. Then we did for Toric and it still worked. And then we did for all the weak final bases, which again, it's a huge amount of, uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount of uh, um, uh, spaces. Again, we're talking about like, you know, um, you know, numbers of order of, of order the 100,000. I mean, I think, I don't think the weak final bases are even known. I mean, I don't think they're even counted by people. And there, you know, it still works. It looks like the Tadpole conjecture is still correct, even, even, even for this, for this weak final basis. So, you know, in a sense, we tried in this particular direction to make it more and more complicated and the, and the Tadpole conjecture is, 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 seems to hold. That's you know one uh, that's one argument again that you know maybe well, maybe what we're looking at is generic. Um, there's another there's another there's also some scenarios which appeared recently uh, by uh, Marquesano, Marquesano Prieto and Wisner um, in which they have uh, some stabilization scenarios at uh, large complex structure moduli, and they have two scenarios in this paper. They have a scenario which is the standard one where the Q in the flux goes like the number of moduli squared, which is again. What we expect, and you know, that's basically the, that's that's supposed to, uh, supposed to be the generic type. But there's a non-standard scenario where the Q in the flux is of order one, which seems to violate the tadpole conjecture. And again, there's some flux which enters the tadpole, which enters in the tadpole, and it, it it also appears in the moduli. 
So in the second scenario by these guys, it looks like you can borrow the Tucker conjecture. However, the problem is that this is a scenario. You know, we're just you know some numbers and you know some fluxes and some and some equations for the axioms and axioms. Um, you can work it out in detail. You can put numbers in. You can actually try in detail to see how it works. And it works for you know for for four moduli. You can make it work. We couldn't make it work for more than four moduli because again it's complicated. The equations become very complicated and so on and so forth. But in general, we believe that it will be impossible to stabilize again a large number of moduli by sourcing an order of one char uh, a charge. And that's basically something which we're doing right now. And you know, there's a, there's a work in progress which we're doing with Callum Brody and uh, Mariana and uh, Seven Illus. Um, why is that? Why, why do you believe that? I want to give you some intuition. You, you basically, and the, the best is to work in F theory because again, you know, or just you know, think about M theory on, 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 a, on, an, on an eight dimensional Calabiao, on a four dimensional Calabiao. The four cycle, you have a four form. The four form can be written in some can, can be decomposed into some integer cohomology basis, which is basically give, which is give, given by these omegas. And there are some numbers, n1 omega 1, n2 omega, omega 2, and so on and so forth. And the tadpole is given by this integral, which is given by n a times eta a b times n b. n a is the flux number, is the flux vector. Eta a b is the intersection matrix. And again, n b is again the flux vector. So that's how the tadpole of this of this of this uh, of this equation is. Now, again, as I said before, naively, you throw an arbitrary amount of flux. You, you throw any fluxes you want. And naively, you can get any tadpole you want. That's basically the intuition. People can just, you know, you can just play with numbers and you have a matrix and you can just put some s and, you know, you can get this number to be one or two or minus one or minus five or however much you want. Nevertheless, there's a problem because at the minimum of the solution, the fact that you have a, uh, at the minimum, the metric of the system adjusts itself such that G4 equals to star G4. This is the condition for supersymmetry, and it's also the condition for um, 0, 0,3 when you have 0, 0,3 fluxes. Uh, this condition is necessary in order to get the minimum. Now, because of this equation, what's going to happen is that the tadpole contribution from all these fluxes is going to be everywhere positive in the Calabi-Aw. So you have a Calabi-Aw form. You have a huge amount of fluxes, which give you positive and negative contributions. But somehow the metric, the, again, the star, is going to adjust itself to give you something everywhere positive. And what we can argue intuitively is that you have many fluxes that give you zero or negative contributions. There's going to be trouble. How can I see that? Again, take some flux vector, which is going to be very similar to the one which is going to be presented in, in a talk later this week. This is an intersection matrix of some, of, of some Calabiao, and this is the kind of matrix which, which appears in this paper. So let's take some Calabiao. With an intersection matrix, and let's put flux only on the A cycles. You see, this is the A cycles one, two, three. So I'm putting flux on the A on, on all the A cycles, and then putting flux on one of the B cycles, just this FB. Now, the tadpole contribution of this mega big of this mega big um, flux matrix. Again, I have a huge number of fluxes. I'm putting like you know one million A cycles. So you know I'm looking at the Calabi all with, the, with you know three hundred thousand um, A fluxes. So I'm looking at a huge amount of A fluxes, and I have this intersection matrix. So I'm putting fluxes to be like you know one 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 on the A cycles, and what you can show is that all these fluxes on the A cycles don't talk to each other at the level of the intersection matrix, and the only flux which enters in the tadpole is going to be F B the flux on the B cycle times this A. So only this corner and only this guy and this guy are going to talk to each other, um, and basically the only the result of the tadpole is going to be two times uh, F B, where F B is the flux on the B cycle. Now. If I break this uh, flux matrix in the cohomology basis, which I, which, I, which I told you before, I can write G as you know G1 plus G2 plus G3 plus G4 plus G5. G1 is again this guy here. G2 is this guy. G3, G4, G5, and so on and so forth. And from the intersection matrix, I can find very easily that you know G1 times G1, for example, G1 with G1 integral over the Calabi-Yau is equal is equal to zero. That's correct, right? I mean, you know, the G1 times if I only have G1, there's no there's not thought problem. If I only have G3, there's no tadpole. If I only have G5, there's no tadpole. If I only have G1 and G3 and G5, there's no tadpole. I need to put flux on the on the even cycles, on the on the B cycles, in order to get any tadpole. So all these integrals, the black integral, the green integral, all these all these integrals of odd Gs are going to give me zero. They are going to be zero on the Calabiao. On the other hand, the integral of the G on the A cycle and the G on the B cycle is going to give me something non-zero. So if I look at this flux matrix, again, if I think about this Calabiao, I'll have a huge amount of fluxes, which give me zero contribution. Their integral is zero. And I have 
have one of them which gives me something positive. I can put FB to be one, you know, just for simplicity. Now, let's see how this Calabria all looks. Again, I if I had a torus, again, it's obvious I can get G1 with G1, with G, G3 with G1 or G3 with G5 to be zero because G1 has some legs and you know G5 has some other legs and basically they give me zero, they're, they're vanishing. But in general, in a Calabria, they're going to be orthogonal. They're going to be uh, intersecting, you know, they'll be overlapping. So if I look at this Calabria, you know, again, imagine looking at the manifold before putting any metric. You just look at the manifold, you think about manifold, topology and fluxes. This is before the metric exists. The metric has not been introduced yet. If I look at this Calabria, I can have my G3 where G3 equals to zero, for example. Uh, this contribution is zero, uh, the integral is zero, but this will be a non-zero quantity generically. There's no reason why this should be zero. So if I think about the Calabiao in the region above the red line, this is going to be positive. In the region below the red line, it's going to be negative. I'm just making a toy example. Yes, so if, if I look at another- hello? Yes, if you have, you have five minutes. Perfect, perfect. If I look at the second integral again, G1, uh, uh, the black integral, G1 is G1, again, I have the black line in the middle. I, of course, I can have a more complicated system, but this is just the minimal thing I need to have. An integral which is zero, of a finite quantity means that you know at least one place is going to be fine plus and one place is going to be minus. So G1 with G1 is going to be positive here and negative here. Again, same thing. If I add again G1 with G5, I'll have another line in the Calabria. Oh, this would be again a very generic form, which is going to be positive in the green region. Again, here, 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 up, up to the right of the green line, and negative to the, to, to the left of the green line. And you can see, and then of course, at the end of the day, I'm coming also with the G1 where G2, which is positive everywhere. So this is going to give me positive, you know, all over the place. This will give me a positive contribution everywhere. But there's a problem. You see, I have two to the power n regions. And basically these regions, all these integrals are going to be zero. So there are two to the power n regions, which are going to have positive contributions and negative contributions. Some of them will have n squared negative contributions, again, here, for example, you can see you know, all these three negative contributions and the, and the positive one here, they're like you know, two positive and two negative. If I have you know, 15, uh, if, if I have two to the power um, 16, you know, there'll be a huge amount of regions and some of them are going to have n squared ne negative contributions and one positive contribution. Now these contributions are integers, you know, this, this comes from integer fluxes. So I cannot play with them. I cannot make them to be one half. I cannot make my, my negative contributions to be less because Again, the, the, the negative contribution comes from a flux whose integral is you know, 17, that's frozen. I cannot play with that. The only thing which I can play with is with the geometry of the Calabiao. And in particular, at the minimum, G4 where G4 is forcing the metric to basically make every region, G4 equals to start G4, is going to, to be forcing the metric. You see, G4 equals to start G4 is the first place where the metric enters. You should think about it as, an, as a metric equation, as, a, as the equation de determining the metric. And this equation is going to force the metric to make the charge of every of this region positive. But you see, I have some regions where this is a huge, there's a huge negative contribution. You know, I have like, you know, n square numbers of order one and one number of order, uh, n square negative numbers of order one and one positive number of order one. And all these numbers, they have to basically, the metric is going to screw things up such that it's going to be positive everywhere. And that's very, very unlikely. And what's happening when you do that, again, you have these regions of negative uh, with a huge negative charge. The metric wants to enhance this plus region, but it cannot. And then what it does, it basically makes the work factor negative. That's what we've seen in flux compactification in, in, in bubbling geometries. Essentially, the metric cannot make such a, such a region to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be happy. It's going to scream and it's going to give you a negative work factor and then it's going to give you close time records. That's basically that's basically the that's basically the intuition why this is not this, this is never going to happen. You'll never get a charge of order of order one because again, getting a charge of order one, you have to get n squared contributions which are negative to be balanced by one contribution which is positive. The numbers are of the same order, so you know it, it'll be it'll be impossible. Um, so this is the step. This is the slide before the last. We have seen that you know this Cape Zilla, you know this 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 idea of like you know finding that the, 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 the problems with 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 the, with, the, with the landscape construction um, has a long trail of destruction. Uh, back in 2010, everybody believed all entrepreneurs are okay, but then Cape Zilla came and said no, that's not happening. Um, then people said they're okay, no, maybe not all entrepreneurs are okay, but you know G-string times NP3 antibrains is okay. So when you have maybe maybe uh, entrepreneurs don't back react are okay. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Joe Poczynski and, other, and, and, and Andrea Pum and um, other people um, arguing for this. 
But then we came and showed that no, this doesn't happen. Um, even, even when there's no back reaction, antibodies are still a problem. Then people say, yeah, single antibody is okay. Yes, but then we show that the single antibody is not okay uh, unless you have a huge amount of throat, or unless you have a huge throat with the, with the large, with the large, uh, with the large um, uh, charge contribution. And then people are said, no problem, you know, we can cancel this with the seven brains and so on and so forth. Uh, but then again, we showed that you cannot cancel this with, with, with the seven brains either. Uh, and then people said, yes, but you know, maybe you can go to F theory and you know, there'll be a miracle and you know, F theory has a huge amount of that or negative that well and so on and so forth. But this didn't happen either. So basically it looks like we have gone from, you know, all these uh, all, all this, um, you know, beliefs of people, which people had that, you know, all interbrains are okay. And you know, just in times N much, much more than one are okay. People believed all these things, but we have actually showed by explicit calculations that, you know, none of these things is, none of these things is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is happening. And essentially, the point which I want to make is that there's no way to get the sitter via antibrain uplift in warp throat. At least it doesn't look like in a flux compatibility we can do it. And moreover, it's impossible. Again, this this uh, length, this tadpole argument is showing that it's impossible to stabilize large number of complex ultra moduli within the tadpole bound. Those are the two. Those are the two points which I wanted to which I wanted to uh, go away from this talk uh, with. Um, and the conclusions again, we did a huge amount of calculation. Again, those are hard calculations, with like you know, really complicated, really complicated stuff with all the factors of two. I mean, this is not some hand waving back of the envelope argument. This is really hard calculations, which could have given pro landscape results or anti landscape results. They all gave anti landscape results. I didn't order them to be like that. That's now that, that, that's what came out of the calculations. Then there's a Romanian proverb. The Romanian proverb says, if three people tell you that you are drunk, go and take a nap. And there's a physics version which is that you have three calculations which tell you that something doesn't work, maybe it's time to give it up. Maybe it's time to give up all this KQT idea, all this landscape idea, all these things. Maybe it's time to sit down and you know, be a bit more humble and you know, try, to, try to get a bit more, uh, try to do, try, try to understand, you know, may, maybe there are some new mechanisms and so on and so forth. And what I think happens is that, you know, at this point, there's no anthropic solution to the fine tuning problems. We are back to the drawing board for string cosmology. There's no control to con the construction of the sitter. There's no string inflation model track and trust. That's Again, the, what, what's happening at, at this level? Um, there's a whole swampland program, which is basically coming up with the same conclusions for using bottom-up arguments, which is again basically confirming this, and you know we are quite happy with this. And the one way out seems to be contestants. Am I happy about it? No. I would have liked that everything would be nice and hunky dory and things to explain everything, but you know we do calculations, and that's the results. The results are saying that you know we cannot we cannot have control of the system at this point, and we may end up with contestants. You know, um, disgusting as it is. Um, then the question again, the final question is, you know, where are we in this, in, in this lens, la, landscape? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thanks for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, it's time for questions. Uh, if there is any, please either raise your hand or simply unmute yourself. Yes, fill in. But just this uh, tadpole issue of fact, the ADS as well, not, not just is it, uh, do I understand correctly? Um, I think so, yes. So, so the tuple problem affects ADS uh, because, you know, the tuple problem says you cannot get, you, you cannot get ADS, you cannot even get an ADS compactification with, with, uh, with, um, with, uh, within the tuple. Right. So, so, uh, right. so that's how I understood you. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I mean, actually, you can get an ADS compactification with unstabilized moduli. If you, if you don't have the stabilized moduli, of course, no problem. You can get, you know, you can, you right, can, you can, you can compactify on this nice super mega big, uh, on this super mega big, um, where is it? The, the thing with the, with, the, with the 10 to the 500. You can compactify on this super mega, on, you know, all this 10 to the 500 vacua, which are all ADS vacua. They can all have they can all have flat directions, you know. There's no problem with them. They can they can be there, you know. This nice super mega big calabia with like you know this thing. No problem. You can do it, but it can have flat directions. So then, when you bring an anti brain, when you want to uplift, it's going to go berserk. Right. So sticking to ADS topic, I mean, we heard from Liam in the morning about various construction uh, he has been doing. I mean, does does this put the two of you in direct? Conflict or is his example somewhat exceptional? I think his example are not his examples are not using a large number of complex of, of complex structure moduli. So you can have complex structure moduli, um, and what we are showing is that a large number of complex structure moduli have a problem. When you have uh, a I few see. complex structure moduli, okay. you can fix things. You see here, you know the Euler characters of the Calabiao console, so it is an H11. So you can also try to make a huge H11, 
and a small HT1. If you do a, if you, if you do a small HT1, uh, let, me, let me go, where is the, I just want to go to the slide where we have, we have this, uh, where we have this thing here. So you have the Q in the fluxes, and then it's HT1, which are taking to be large and to grow, to, to, to grow like the number of moduli. But if you have a large H, H11 and a small HT1, for example, then, you know, it could work. Personally, I think it's on much more shakier ground because personally, you know, Kela modulus, I mean, complex structure modulus stabilization is nice. It's classical. You put some fluxes, you put some stuff, you have a matrix, you minimize, you know, there's a nice clean calculation. Kela modulus stabilization is much more fishy, in my opinion, because you need to put, you know, the seven brains, you know, with Higgsable and Higgsable, and you need to put like, you know, the, the, there are very few of them which you can put because, you know, you, if you put too many D7 brains, you know, you, don't, you, you have a D7 tadpole. Um, if you put get genome condensation of all the cycles, the cycles need to have some arithmetic genus, and you have fluxes, and the fluxes can give you negative results. It's a big mess. I mean, of course, you can always hope that, you know, keep, keep your finger, fingers crossed that everything is going to be hunky dory. But in my opinion, Kela modular stabilization is much less kosher than complex structure modular stabilization. So, you know, where I come from, you know, I work on black hole physics. And you know, on black hole physics, you know, you cannot just say, oh, I have a black hole microstate, everything is hunky dory, because I can overcome the black hole entropy. You do precision calculations. You only accept the backgrounds which are smooth and singularity free. You only do, so, you know, you cannot say, ah, oh, you know, there's a huge number of vacua and, you know, maybe some of them are going to work out. I have a huge amount of equations and maybe some of them are going to have a solution. No, you need to find the solution. And in, for complex structure moduli, for, for Kähler moduli stabilization, you know, you can just say, I have a huge number of Kähler moduli, there are a huge number of instantons, but nobody has done the calculation. For complex structure well, modules, you can do the calculation. So that's why I think, you know, I'm, I'm a much happier, I mean. I, I, I think we, we could move to the next question. Although, I, I, since I attended this uh, morning's uh, talk by Liam, uh, indeed, uh, Liam's model had uh, like five, order five complex structure moduli and order a hundred uh, killer mm -hmm. moduli, but they do claim that they have a, a computation that stabilizes them. So it's sure. Okay. I mean, but, absolutely. I mean, I have no problem. I mean, it, it, right. that's a different field of research. I mean, you know, I have no, I have no qualms. I mean, again, people can increase as much as they want H11, uh, and you know, keep HD1 small. I have no problems with that. What we are showing is that you know, huge amount of HD1 is there's a problem. And moreover, again, uh, this 10 to the power 272,000 va vacuum and so on and so forth, which again, may, which has a huge HD1. There, there's a problem. So you know, essentially, you know, in most of the F theory models, you know, this is where this is the number which is which is large. Let's take another question for Fernando. Hey, hi. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Well, I just wanted to, well, first make a comment about uh, when you mentioned our paper. So um, it's true that in the generic scenario, in some sub case, we find that the, um, the tuple is growing with the number of, um, of moduli, but it's one sub case. Um, in general, we don't know. I mean, from our perspective, in general, we were not able to prove in this generic scenario what happens. You know, we try, but at least naively, we didn't see anything. So, uh, okay. So our statement is that, okay, we don't know if it grows quadratically or what. Oh, I, I see. I thought it was quadratical. I mean, at least we, we tried to play with it and it came up quadratical, but. Okay. From our yeah, equation. In mm -hmm. one subject, yes, but in, in for other choices mm -hmm. and other answers for the fluxes, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. But the linear, um, but the place where it's order one, I think the intersection. May, I mean, I think the fluxes you have are of this type, right? I mean, if, I, if I'm not wrong, I mean, you have many cycle, many fluxes on the A cycles, and just something on the B cycle. So the tadpole is only given by this guy talking to this guy, but all the other fluxes on the A cycles are basically giving you giving you zero tadpole, if I understand right. They are giving you zero intersection. Yeah, that's true. Zero intersection, and therefore zero tuple contribution. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is a problem. This is a problem because zero intersection, again, that's the cohomology answer. But if you look in the Calabiao, if you look at what exactly happens, zero intersection means that there's an integral which is finite, which is you know, positive somewhere and negative somewhere. And another guy which has zero intersection, it's, it's another integral which is going to be in an overlapping regime of parameters, which is positive somewhere and negative somewhere else. So at the end of the day, you'll have n squared integrals, which are going to be zero positive somewhere and negative somewhere. There will be again a huge number of regions of the Calabiao. This is before you put you put any metric. This is before you stabilize anything. This is just the level of topology. And then once you put a metric, it's going to be a problem. That's basically my 
this is our intuition again based on what's happening in, in bubbling geometries yeah Maybe okay here, I, I don't get this intuition because i mean who intersects and who doesn't first is a matter of the basis of uh, three cycles that you take and second i don't understand the um the screaming argument of the metric because the word factor is supposed to be completely independent of all this whole game of uh, complex structure model civilization of course there's a word factor that comes then when you solve the equations but for for finding where the model is stabilized the word factor doesn't play any role because you are in middle cohomology mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but uh, so I think what's happening is that we, if everybody. I, I thought that the that yeah. conjecture was completely independent of the word factor. It doesn't play any role. Um, no, no, no. The tuple conjecture, of course. I mean, if you, if you put, I, I think the metric is, is, is crucial. Um, maybe, okay, maybe I have the wrong thing with the word factor. So I think what's happening, at least in the, exam, in the examples which I know, if you put some regions with a huge amount of negative charge in the faxes. So again, you look at this wedge, for example, where there are like, you know, three negative contributions from zero intersection guys and one positive guy. Here, if you just have like, you know, you put some random numbers, you have three negative numbers of order one and one positive number of order one. This would be, this would be in, in, in general, a negative number. Now the metric doesn't want negative numbers. Why, why no. is it negative? I don't understand. Because uh, you have this huge amount of forms which have zero intersection. When you have two forms which have zero intersections, the forms have non-trivial legs. This, this form, the, the form, you know, G1 or G5, for example. This is a form which is, which is the top form which is going to be finite, you know, the Calabiao. Well, only when you do a T6 or when you do a T8 or when you do some very special geometry, you can get forms which are zero everywhere, where, you know, G5, G1 or G5 is zero locally. In general, G1 or G5, and you know, you have a huge amount of cycles, you know, G, you know, any two, any two A cycle for fluxes are going to be, or are, are not going to be orthogonal. They're going to give you some number which is going to be positive in some region, negative in some region is, is going to integrate to zero. This is where the zero intersection comes from. The forms have zero intersection because they integrate to zero, but locally G1 or G5 is going to be positive in some place and negative in some other place. That's why it integrates to zero. It will not be zero, lo locally zero. This is the key point. And therefore it will be negative in some region and positive <coughs> in some other. And the same will happen with all the N squared guys which don't talk to each other. All the fluxes which don't enter in the tadpole, they are going to have a non-trivial intersection uh, they would have zero intersections, so therefore they're going to have negative regions and positive regions. And in general, you know, there's no reason why these regions are going to be on top of each other. These regions are going to be, you know, separate. So you'll have a huge amount of regions, like I'm showing this in, the, in this cucumber graph. And these regions are going to have a huge, I mean, and some of them are going to have a huge amount of negative contribution. This is again before the metric. I'm not putting any work factor. I'm not putting, I'm, I'm just looking at the level of topology and intersection. I'm not just looking, I think, Calabio plus fluxes. And then I come in with the G, I come in with, with a star and I come in with the, with the, word, with the word factor. And what's happening is that when you have a region like this, I think the word factor wants to go negative in order to compensate because you see here is negative. Here is a negative the tadpole. The word factor have... doesn't see G5 or G3 or G1. It sees, it sees the whole flux and that's what matters. So separating the them- sum, It sees the sum indeed, absolutely. So here is going to see the sum, but you see the sum of these guys, they, 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 they'll all be negative, right? I mean, you, you have you have G1, with, I mean, all the odd guys are going to give you negative contributions. And okay, there'll be one positive one. Um, but then at the end of the day, you have to have G4 equals to star G4. And when G4 equals to star G4, this implies that locally, everywhere on the Calabiao, this has to be positive. So this region, which has, again, n squared negative guys and one positive guy, has to somehow turn up positive. And that's where the problem is going to be. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's